welcome everyone who is coming into this event. I'm just going to give it just a couple of minutes. So around like 403, we'll get started. Um, I know everyone's getting logged in and getting settled. So we will be with you in just a couple of minutes. All right, so we will actually go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody. This is our fourth Castle conversation that we've had. My name is Morgan Yunker. I am the retention and outreach manager for the College of Art Sciences and Letters. Um, some of you may know me, some others might not, um, but really my role is to you know, find ways to bring students together, be that person that you can come to if you have any issues, um, so I will be sharing my email with everybody. If you need anything, especially our students, please reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help you either find resources, um, you know, work through issues that you might be having in terms of courses or in terms of other things that might be happening. Um, definitely just here to help you in any way. And that's sort of where this came from is we were seeing a lot of students you know, having the same issues or struggling to find resources. So we thought, well, why don't we bring that to you? So we started these Castle Conversations and we invite faculty and staff to share information about academic programs, information about like our learning centers, tutoring opportunities on different events that the campus is having uh, to help support you. We know that this time, you know, having remote courses, you're not as um, connected to either each other, um, to faculty, to staff, to different resources. So we really want to help kind of bridge that gap. So that's really the main purpose of why we do these. Um, we hope that they benefit you. Um, we know that it's enjoyable for us to know that students are, you know, part of these and you are participating. So, so if you have any questions, if you have comments or concerns, please use the Q&A function um, in this different event and either myself, the Dean or some of the faculty that we have with us today will be able to answer those questions. So without further ado, I want to share with you what our agenda looks like today. Uh, as mentioned, or as normal, we will hear from our Dean, Martin Hershock. Um, he will share some information with you about actually several different items today. Um, I will talk a little bit about some of our upcoming events. And then we're gonna to get to hear from some really awesome faculty members um, regarding some of our academic programs. Uh, in the math department, integrative studies, if you haven't heard of that major, we're gonna hear a little bit about that. And then some undergraduate research opportunities. And then of course, we'll finish up with any of those questions that you might've asked throughout this um, conversation itself, or if you posed a previous or question uh, via email when you registered for the event. So I will, I uh, turn myself off here and I will turn it over to our Dean, Martin Hershock. Great. Thank you, Morgan. And hopefully people can hear me. And I'm sorry to be coming to you from my phone, but I've been having technical difficulties. So this was my 
backup backup device after two laptops failed me on connecting to Zoom. I hope this finds all of you uh, doing well and making your way through the heart of the academic term. Um, I know it's a, a long slog and it's been difficult in this remote environment, uh, but I very much appreciate the effort that you are putting in along with the effort of the faculty and staff in the College of Arts, Sciences and Letters uh, to support you in your learning and um, in supporting uh, the things that you need to do to be successful. So I just wanted to talk to you about just a few things today before I uh, get back, uh, turn things back to Morgan and to the uh, faculty who are uh, and staff who are assembled to talk to you today. First thing I wanna remind you all of is, <coughs> excuse me, the importance of registering for your winter classes as early as you possibly can. Um, the reason that this is important is because the college monitors uh, course enrollments uh, very carefully. And uh, if enrollments in particular courses are, um, are low, uh, there comes a point in the uh, enrollment period where we have to make a decision about whether or not to allow that course uh, to run uh, or not. And if there are no students enrolled or just a tiny handful, um, unfortunately, it usually means that we have to pull the plug on the course. And now, it very well may be the case that there are others out there who had intended to take it or are hoping to take it, but we don't know that. And so, um, since we can't uh, read tea leaves and our crystal ball doesn't always provide us with that information, it's imperative that you enroll as, as quickly as you possibly can. Likewise, um, if there is sufficient demand in certain courses to warrant adding a, an additional section or maybe an additional lab uh, in support of a, a lab-based course, uh, the sooner we uh, know that, the better it is in terms of us finding uh, an instructor and, and getting a new section opened. So again, please uh, consider enrolling for your winter courses uh, as soon as you possibly can so that uh, we're able to uh, meet demand and help students to get what they need uh, as in as timely a, a, a manner as we possibly can. The next thing I wanted to uh, chat with you just briefly about um, is, is workload. Um, it's been an interesting uh, semester and I've been hearing from um, a, a fair number of students who have found themselves uh, struggling with uh, the workload that they're encountering. Uh, and it's a function of, of a number of things. Uh, we do have a new uh, a new tuition model uh, for the university, which of course incentivizes taking uh, more than 12 credit hours because you don't pay anything additional for that. So we found some students who perhaps um, were a little overly ambitious in terms of scheduling and maybe have taken on uh, more courses than they um, probably should have, especially given uh, the workload that many of our students uh, um, also maintain in terms of employment outside of the home. Um, but we're also finding that um, the, the, the traditional sort of classroom environment has also changed in light of the current pandemic and in light of uh, what is uh, best practice across the country. Many traditional classes um, might have a very small number of high a final and maybe a lengthy research paper with a little bit of your grade determined by class participation. But those other three assignments might be weighted very, very heavy. Uh, that can be a really stressful situation for students because there's a lot that hangs in the balance. Uh, particularly though in uh, this remote learning environment uh, that might make things even, even more difficult or more stressful. So uh, a lot of literature out there 
actually uh, suggests that a better approach, especially in a remote learning environment, is to use a series of low stakes assignments. So you might have more assignments, but their overall contribution to your final grade is, is much smaller. And uh, our faculty have, in large part, adopted that model. Now, what that means is that students may be facing a lot more smaller assignments uh, over time. And that's definitely what I'm hearing from people. So um, I, I did want you to know that um, there's good reason for some faculty having gone that route and adopting that model. It really was intended to help students uh, not to make things more difficult for them. So um, what I would say is if you find yourself struggling uh, with the workload or with particular classes, by all means, reach out for help. Very first person you should reach out to is your, uh, is your faculty member, is the professor who's teaching the course. They will do um, uh, as much as they possibly can to assist you, to provide you with uh, maybe some study approaches or different ways of thinking about how you should tackle your coursework. If you need additional help, uh, Morgan already mentioned the learning centers. Uh, here in the College of Arts, Sciences and Letters, we've got the Writing Center. We have the Math Learning Center. There's the Science Learning Center uh, and the Foreign Language uh, Lab. All of those uh, facilities provide um, excellent support uh, for students and can help you if you are struggling in those subject areas. Uh, if you haven't already also been participating in instruction, uh, that's something to explore. Many courses throughout the college have supplemental instruction attached to those. Those are, I guess, they're facilitated by students who've already taken and succeeded in the classes that you're taking. Uh, that's an excellent way of also uh, getting some additional help. So, um, I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is, is, is to reach out and ask for help. Don't be embarrassed about it. Everyone uh, struggles at one point or another in their college careers. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. And people are eager to help you. Um, we know the workload is, is, is hard. We know the times are to take time for yourself, right? I mean, you certainly wanna make sure you're getting enough sleep, that you're eating well, that you're not just sitting at your desk all day like I do. Um, and I sort of welcome when my dogs scratch at the door and tell me they need to go outside because it's a reminder that I need to get up and move around, do that. And by all means, if you need to take a half a day or a day off just to rest and recuperate, do that. It's important that you stay healthy and focused. And with that, I would like to wish you all a, a happy Thanksgiving. You will have an extended break this year. Um, and again, I hope that you were able to find some time over that Thanksgiving break uh, to rest and to focus on, on self-care and on yourself. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Morgan and I look forward to hearing from the faculty participants today. Thanks so much, Marty. So I actually was cracking up a little bit during this. I hope all of our students know all of us struggle with this remote environment. And Dean Hershock, you did a great job. Um, there was definitely some lag time in there. And, you know, maybe a little, it sounded like you were a little fast, like a chipmunk sometimes. So technology is our friend, it is our enemy, but I just want everyone to know that we are all in this together. And it doesn't matter if you are the Dean of the college, um, if you're a student, if you're a staff member like me, every once in a while that technology gets to us. So just, just know that we're all human and we're all in this together. So if that hopefully brightens your day a little bit and just gives you that sigh of relief, just know that, you know, it does that for all of us. So as far as some of the upcoming events that the university has, um, typically this slide is actually full of events, but when I was looking at 
um, the website, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of different or new events that are happening. Um, there's lots of things that you can check out via the umdearborn.edu backslash events webpage. Um, if you haven't been there already, there's opportunities for um, meditation, um, different um, counseling services that are available if you need somebody to talk to. Um, there's certainly things like the math club and the French club that meet weekly. Um, certainly check those different events out. Um, but with the upcoming Thanksgiving break coming up, I think a lot of people are just kind of taking that time to um, do those different events in, in mental health and self-help um, rather than doing like a panel or doing a video or having guest speakers. So um, feel free to check out the events webpage. And if there's something on there that is interesting to you, definitely check it out. Um, but we will be able to... Um, Oh, I'm actually getting a message here that tonight at 6 p.m. there's an alumni connect event. Um, so that is on me that I missed. Um, Patty, do you know who is hosting that? Is it Career Services? Maybe we'll wait to see if she responds. But if not, um, certainly check that out um, that you can certainly do that. I'm gonna actually unmute. Patty, she is our internship director for the College of Arts, Sciences and Letters. So she will actually hopefully be able to really talk us through what this event is. Go ahead, Patty. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. It, it's the talent gateway, I think, and in, in, in which involves career services too. And um, students who'd like to connect with alumni, it's so cool. They've already signed the alumni up and all you have to do is sign up and then you get to talk with alumni and you don't have to prepare anything. And it's at six o'clock tonight, but if you go to the campus web events, like Morgan said, you'll find it there. Um, I, I was just looking at this, the sign-in sheet that uh, there's a really easy little two things to fill out and you're signed up. So just take a look at that. It's a great thing for students to do is talk to alumni about, how, what, about the path that they were on. Perfect, thank you, Patty, for sharing that with us. Yep, that was definitely something I missed. So if you're free tonight at six, um, certainly, give it a shot. Um, talk with some alumni. You'll never know what type of connections you're going to make and they could be the next person offering you an internship or offering you a job. So with that, I am going to start um, turning it over to my colleagues, starting with John Clifford, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the math department. He is a faculty member within math, um, but John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Morgan. Hi, my name is uh, John Clifford. I'm a professor in the mathematics department, as Morgan said. Um, our picture that we're seeing here is a Professor Zhao. She's also a professor in the uh, mathematics department. Um, so I'm gonna just give a just really big overview of what, what we're doing uh, in the math department. So as, as we see on the slide, uh, the math department has, uh, well, it, we have three uh, majors. We have the, a major in mathematics, that's the third one on, on the slide. And um, we have a major in applied statistics. Um, a new major that we have is in actuarial science. So that's the top one. Um, actuarial science is a, a very exciting uh, uh, for the math department. Uh, it's new and exciting. Um, we have a lot of energy around it. Uh, think of actuarial science as bringing together uh, statistics and mathematics and economics and business. So it's, it's really tries to, it reaches out and it's very multidisciplinary. And uh, um, one of the things I, 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 that caught my attention uh, 30, 30 uh, 40 years ago when I was in school was uh, the job satisfaction in actuarial science. It seemed to be always in the top three in job satisfaction. And, and today, you know, best jobs, it's usually in the top, top three. Um, we have a, an applied statistics department uh, that's very uh, hands-on. You're doing lots of programming and, and working with data. If you've, it's a 
I think of statistics as a, as a, as a very large field. There's lots of small aspects of, uh, there's lots of uh, uh, facets to statistics. If I were to summarize statistics, I say it's the science of using data to make decisions. And, you know, making good decisions is something we all want to do. And uh, so, you know, uh, learning about the science of making good decisions, I think is fascinating. I myself am a mathematician. Um, I'm the program advisor, and I'd be happy to meet with any students and talk to you about the, any of these programs, programs in mathematics, uh, statistics, or I'd, I would actually uh, help you find the right people to talk to uh, in applied statistics and actuarial science. Um, the fourth uh, item on the list uh, on the slide is uh, a new certificate we have. So if you're majoring in mathematics or, or actuarial science or statistics, you could get a, uh, you, on top of that, you could get a certificate by taking some more classes, you could get a certificate in the mathematics for finance. Um, I think of the mathematics department is very inclusive. Um, it's a very, we have about 70 majors in math and 30 majors in statistics, maybe 25 majors in actuarial science. Um, and it's, uh, if you're interested, please reach out. I'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, and I'll hand it over back over to Morgan. Great. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, definitely. If you are looking for any information, uh, reach out to Professor Clifford. Um, there are so many folks in the math department. My office is on the second floor, which is where the math department is housed. And when we were on campus, I always remember Friday afternoons, um, uh, math students and some math faculty were always playing ping pong in the kind of general meeting area. So it's a lot of fun to see um, some people, you know, math might be scary, but they definitely make it enjoyable. They make it fun to learn. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to another math faculty member. However, he's going to share a little bit of information about a newer um, major that we have called Integrative Studies. This major, I think, is a couple of years old. But if you haven't heard about it, um, Mike Lachance is going to share a little bit about Integrative Studies with us. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. So. Uh, I, as Morgan said, I am one of the mathematics faculty members, but I'm uh, an associate dean in the college, one of two. And uh, one of my responsibilities is the uh, major that we call integrative studies. So integrative studies is uh, a kind of way that you can design a little bit your own degree program. So we of course have traditional majors, mathematics, psychology, economics, things like that. Uh, but integrative studies allows you not to choose a major, but rather to choose, uh, I think of it as three minors. So we had one student, for example, who got a minor in mathematics, a minor in economics, and a minor in statistics. And those three together proved to be very marketable for this individual. So in a sense, if you have a vision for yourself where you want to create an opportunity, a synergy between three areas that you think work, uh, then we are prepared to help you do that. And so at the end of your study, all of our students need to take a uh, capstone course. The capstone course in this instance is a sort of synthesis of the three areas that you've chosen. So you're not uh, thinking of these as uh, sort of being in a silo but rather that they actually do work together. Now, uh, this program has been in place for a very long time. It's uh, uh, in that sense, uh, you can find lots of uh, faculty that will help you uh, engage in this if you wish. You of course can reach out to me directly. Uh, so Morgan can provide those kinds of details for you. Uh, there is a new wrinkle that we've added. Of course, you've heard of the pandemic. So uh, we've added some specializations into integrative studies. Uh, our thinking and probably yours is that a lot of people will want to understand uh, the dynamics of uh, pandemics and things like that. And of course, it's not just the health issues, it has economic impacts, it has all sorts of other ramifications. And so integrative studies provides an opportunity for you to sort of harness those interests, your interests. So I think that's it for me, Morgan. 
That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, definitely with integrative studies too, just one thing I'll add before I turn it over to Eunice is um, really think about something that you want, right? If, you're, if you have a career in mind and you're really looking um, for these certain skills to build into and to, to really make yourself marketable for that career, that's, that's where integrative studies um, really plays a, a, a great role. Um, I know students who have take, who know they want to be a doctor, but they also want to open, you know, their own practice someday. So they are taking their typical hard science courses, whether it's in biology or chemistry. Um, and then they're combining that with a psychology, but then they're also taking a business course, um, a business, um, business courses so that they can get that business background in order to become a doctor and open their own practice. So if you have kind of that career um, goal in mind, you can really build whatever you want um, from Castle programs out of that. So definitely keep that in mind. And Mike, I think you did a great job of explaining exactly what it was. So without further ado, we're gonna hear a little bit about research opportunities. I know this is something that our students um, have questions about, they're really interested in. So we have um, our faculty member, Eunice, Zaytun Shu, and he is going to share a video with all of you and talk to you a little bit about some of the undergraduate research opportunities that we have here in the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters. So Eunice, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Morgan. I was trying to find the uh, mute button. Can you hear me well, everyone? All right, I assume you can, and I assume you, all, you can also see my screen. Uh, I'm sharing my own slides. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to see you all here. As uh, Morgan and Marty said at the beginning, uh, in this virtual environment, we see less and less of each other. On a regular uh, school year, when I'm on uh, campus, I see hundreds of students uh, in a month. But I, in this environment, we only get to know only a few of you. So I'm happy to meet with more of you in this setting. Uh, I am also a faculty member at the mathematics and statistics department. I am a mathematician too, but today I will tell you a little bit about undergraduate research. This is my uh, one of my favorite things uh, within the college and in my professional life too. I like teaching all my regular classes and doing research, but I also enjoy and uh, have a lot of fun doing research with students like you. So this is not like giving some uh, 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 teaching a class, but we are collaborating on something. We do something together. So what is undergraduate research, how we do it? I'll try to explain that in a few minutes. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, Morgan referred to a video. Uh, instead of showing it here right now, uh, one of our colleagues, Sue, uh, Sue uh, was able to put that on the website. So you can go back there uh, later on after this webinar, you can go there and watch the video, which I'm sure you will enjoy. There will be some overlap with I will tell you right now, but you will also see a very nice interview with one of our graduates who did undergraduate research at multiple levels uh, and worked with me too. And now she's at Stanford uh, pursuing her PhD. You can hear her perspective in that video too. All right, so what is undergraduate research? Undergraduate research is one of those high impact practices, uh, which means you will get a high return. This is uh, certified either by different studies or when you hear from people who participated in these programs, they reflect on this high return in these programs. So in that sense, it is very similar to study abroad, service learning and internships. So in a way, these uh, undergraduate research and other high impact practices are like, you, you, you may have a short list that you want to complete, a bucket list you want to complete throughout your college career. It might be something like, I want to go to a huge football game and uh, join the crowd there, uh, which I have done when I was at Ohio. I went to many U of M OSU games. Uh, but uh, that's the fun part of it in terms of your academics and professional development. Uh, undergraduate research will be some should be something on your list that you want to complete before graduation. Uh, why do I advertise it that way? Because it is a very high interaction program. 
and uh, you immerse yourself into a single field for an extended period of time where you will learn really uh, 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 details of that particular subject and you will get a feeling whether you really like that area or not. You will get a good feeling whether you want to do research in the rest of your life or you want to do some other things. And all of those outcomes, whatever answers you come out of those investigations will be good for you. So interaction, when you do undergraduate research, you usually interact with a professor. It will be quite different than taking a class with that professor. It will be usually just 101 and two of you together working on something, collecting some data, working on some problems, uh, reading research articles together or books together. Or you may also have a couple of other team members working with you, but it will be usually a small group where you will have really a high level of interaction and you will immerse yourself into that field. So it will not be just like taking a single subject course. It will be a bunch of courses combined together to understand what is going on uh, on that particular research problem. Maybe you will remember something you did in your first year, or maybe you will uh, use a tool that you, use, uh, you learned in a course different than your specific subject area. And maybe you will learn something you learned in your uh, writing classes to make a very clean presentation on your findings in chemistry. So it's a place where lots of skills and things you learn uh, come together and you usually present something uh, nice and uh, interesting to other people. And uh, these undergraduate research programs, they usually lead to many opportunities. So this first slide was about, this is a great thing, you should do it. All right, how do you do it? It is also quite straightforward. First, you have to choose an area. So think, uh, or just sit down and think about it, which area you want to study. Think about the courses you have taken or things you want to do in uh, after graduation. Think about all those things and uh, start with an area. Say like, I want to study more biology. I'm really interested in uh, psychology. I want to learn more about education or I want to learn more about political science. What is going on with the elections this year? Can I do a little bit more to learn more what's going on there to make sense of things? Now you have an area of uh, study. You want to learn more in that particular area. In order to complete your research program, you have to find a mentor or sometimes a program. So a mentor is easy. One of your professors on campus will be more than happy to help you to navigate through research in that particular area. Or sometimes you can find a program. For example, instead of just working with a single faculty member, you can participate in a lab and you can be in a more structured environment. Or you may take a capstone course in that particular area you want to investigate. On campus, we have a summer undergraduate research program. Sure, it's been running for the last uh, two and three years. We had to pause it last year, but it started three years ago. And probably there will be another version of that happening this summer. Uh, research experience for undergrads, REU. This is a very common abbreviation you will hear when you are in college. And these are programs usually funded by external agencies. And here on campus in Castle, we have programs like that. If you want to uh, participate in something like that, you will have opportunities. And in addition to opportunities here in Castle, you may uh, investigate other research opportunities at different institutions. All right, so you choose an area of study, you find a program or a mentor, you talk to a professor, maybe you work with that professor or maybe that professor says, this is a very interesting area, but I haven't done much work in there, but my colleague, Professor Y can do it. So how about we put you in touch with that other professor or I know this program happening uh, at MSU, or I know this program happening in California. How about I put you in touch with those folks and you can get a good research experience working with those individuals or with those group of people. So then you sit down and complete your research project, which is also very important and probably the most important piece in the puzzle uh, to get really to produce something on your own. 
this doesn't have to be something brand new that no one has ever thought of. That's not what we expect in undergraduate research. As long as it is a discovery for you, something that you discover on your own, maybe with your mentors, assistants, and other people in your program, you want to discover something on your own, that is a good outcome. And once you have discovered something like that, the story will not end there and you will go to the next phase where you disseminate your findings. You share it with other people. You go to conferences, you talk to other researchers from other institutions. All of a sudden you are part of that research community and it is a lot of fun. Myself, every summer for the so many years, I've been running uh, undergraduate research programs in mathematics and uh, I like all of part, all parts of my professional life, but that summer is also special to me when I get together with students and work on projects. And then we go to conferences together. We go to a different city. We go out to restaurants, we eat together. We walked around uh, and talked to other people working in mathematics. So that part is a lot of fun and you will enjoy too. There will be dissemination opportunities here on campus. You may present to the castle community, you may present to the campus community, but whatever you do at the end of finding something in your research program, you have to tell other people about that. All right, just to wrap up, if you want to learn more in a particular area, if you want to get your hands dirty in research, talk to your professors, don't be shy, just ask questions. Uh, all of my colleagues will be happy to share their experience with you. And if you want to talk to someone different, as my uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, research coordinate, undergraduate research coordinator of the college, I'll be more than happy to talk to you uh, anytime you are available. And I'll be happy to navigate through those questions, help you to find a mentor or a program. Uh, you can talk to your classmates. You will see people around you saying, oh, last summer I participated in this program or last semester I worked in this lab with this professor or next year I'm planning to join this uh, research group. So you will hear those sorts of things. And again, ask them questions like how they did it. You can find so many uh, pieces of information online when you search different things. And within the college, uh, Sue is maintaining a very nice website for uh, for all of you guys where you can find information and links to other places. So please uh, look at there and keep up with announcements. For example, you are participating in this webinar and there will be other things where you will hear announcements about research opportunities. So just to wrap up, undergraduate research is a great piece to add your college education. It is a place where you put all the things you learned in classroom together in an applied manner to uh, figure out a, a problem with some help from your mentor. It is fun to tell about your findings to other people and lots of students who have participated in undergraduate research program, they commented very positively on their experience, whether they were trying to get into a graduate program or finding a job right after graduation. So with that, I'll turn it back to Morgan and I'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. So much information, so much good information. Um, looking back on my undergraduate experience, I wish I would have done research. There's so many things I wish I would have done really. Maybe I should have just go back to school and just quit my job and just do all of these awesome experiences that we have. Um, I do want to make note just of a couple of things um, in the chat, all of you should be able to link to that video that was referenced. Um, it's there's a link to the website where you can find it or I did a direct link to the YouTube channel that you can find the video. Um, if you missed anything that anybody here today, any of our panelists were talking about all of these um, conversations are recorded. They are on our website on Castle's website. They are also sent out in an email. Um, for the next conversation that you can sign up for. So if you missed anything, there are certainly opportunities for you to rewatch these, um, share them with your friends, what have you. And then the last thing I wanna do is, um, Eunice mentioned Sue Gaddert's name a couple of times, and I just wanna thank her for everything that she's done to help make these happen, um, from sending out all of the invites to making sure that we all sound good, look good, um, everything else. So thank you to Sue for that. So now I'll ask all of our panelists to Go ahead and turn your videos on and turn your microphones on. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A. 
For any of our attendees, students, staff, faculty, if you have any questions, um, feel free to use the chat function, the Q&A function, or if you wanna raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask your questions. But the first question that we have, I think uh, Dean Hershock, you might wanna answer this one. Could you talk a little bit about what the schedule looks like from this point moving forward? Sure, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Okay, and I don't sound like a chipmunk anymore or I don't look like a bad Godzilla movie. Good, all right. <laughs> uh, so good to know that's recorded. Can't wait to see it. Um, so yes, the uh, semester is about to take a turn. Um, so Friday, November 20th is the last day that we are um, scheduled to operate with the current modality that is primarily uh, remote learning, but there is a hand, there are a handful of courses uh, that meet on campus. So they will continue to do so up through the 20th of November. Um, the week of Thanksgiving, so Monday the 23rd of November, all the way through Friday the 27th is fall Thanksgiving break. So there's no classes um, uh, during that week and nor are faculty, sh should they be expecting homework or demanding homework from you. Um, there may be some ongoing assignments that you're working on at that time, but uh, if you find yourself with a professor who may be asking you to turn something in, by all means, uh, let <laughs> me know <laughs> and uh, we'll be happy to uh, look into that for you. Um, so it's supposed to be a week off for you to decompress and gather your, your thoughts. Um, and then we're gonna be teaching remotely after that, uh, starting uh, uh, the Monday after Thanksgiving, all the way up through uh, December 14th, which is the last day of classes. Uh, study days are a little unusual. Uh, Tuesday, December the 15th is a study day because there are then final exams scheduled on um, the December 16th through the 18th. And then there is another uh, study period December 19th and 20th, uh, because there are finals scheduled the 21st and 22nd. So it's a little different than it has been in the past. There will not be um, an in-person um, commencement for our December graduates, unfortunately. Uh, the university is, however, working on an event to commemorate and recognize all of you. I was just on campus last week recording a message to the graduates. So that will be available um, relatively soon. And then for winter very quickly, uh, we're gonna uh, start off, uh, winter's gonna be a hybrid, but we're starting uh, the semester a little later than we normally would. So we're gonna start on Wednesday, January 13th. Uh, normally we would have started on the 6th. Uh, winter recess or spring break has been eliminated but your faculty will be encouraged to build some mental health days into their syllabi. Um, so hopefully they will abide by that request. Um, so all courses are gonna be taught completely online from uh, Wednesday, January 13th, first day of classes up through Friday, February 26th. And then starting Monday, March 1st, and assuming that the pandemic conditions uh, allow us to do so, there will be a handful of uh, in-class courses or in-person courses that will start meeting on um, uh, March the 1st. Um, again, it will not be the overwhelming majority. It'll be a small minority of classes. Classes will end all together on Tuesday, uh, April the 20th. And then you will have um, uh, study days on April the 21st and um, April 24th, 25th. Final exams are going to be April 22nd to 23rd. And then again, April 26th through 28th. So um, that's what the rest of the fall and the winter look like. It's yet to be determined what summer and fall of 2021 will look like, but planning is already underway for that. All right. Great, thank you. Yes, lots to say, but I think really good information and hopefully really helpful. The next question we have, somebody asked about the criminal justice four plus one program. So I'm just gonna briefly run through some information 
information about this program and how you get involved in it. Um, this is a program that allows you to essentially earn a bachelor's and master's degree in five years. Um, so you would essentially be taking three years of those undergraduate classes and then two years of those master level courses have both degrees in that five years. So if you are interested in this and you wanna get involved, um, you have to be a junior class standing. Um, you have to have a GPA of at least a 3.0 and then you have to be recommended um, for the program by a criminology and criminal justice faculty member. So if this is something that you're interested in, you can reach out to the director of the um, criminology and criminal justice master's program. That's Dr. Paul Drouse, and I can um, put his email into the chat function. Um, but the first step that I would highly recommend you do is actually talk to a current CCJ faculty member, whomever that might be, if you're close with one of them, um, talk with them about the program and they should be able to help you um, kind of navigate through what that looks like. Um, but if you do have any additional questions, certainly reach out to me, um, but I will put um, Dr. Drouse's email address into the chat function for everyone right now. Other than that, those were kind of the two questions that we had. So again, I'm, I'm just gonna wait a couple of minutes to see if any folks um, with us today have questions. Again, you can raise your hand or you can type them into the chat function, um, whichever you feel um, comfortable with. Do any of our panelists have something that we should have mentioned that wasn't mentioned in today's recording? I have a, a question for Eunice about undergraduate research. Um, Eunice, um, do you happen to know uh, how many of our students um, actually get their name on a, on a publication as a result of uh, the work that they do? Maybe you don't have the statistics handy, but uh, that's maybe something else worth mentioning uh, is the numbers of our students who actually uh, Get to put that on their graduate school applications or, or what have you. I don't know if you have any statistics uh, on that or not. That's a good question and unfortunately I don't have that statistics uh, in terms of Castle students uh, but one thing I can say it is uh, at least in the examples I know in the last so many years it is hard for anyone to publish anything without participating in a program like this and then when you publish something it's a really big deal, especially I can speak of mathematics, to have a publication, a peer reviewed publication in your resume when you go for a graduate school application or for a job application. So it is, it is really uh, useful and uh, undergraduate research programs might be your gateway to get uh, a publication in a peer reviewed journal. Uh, and that will make you a published author and that will be a really big, uh, uh, piece of your college uh, experience. Yeah, I, I know we had um, some statistics that were from natural sciences. And I think over the last 10 years, nine years, they were averaging uh, roughly 17 students who were showing up on faculty publications uh, on a yearly basis. So that's, that's pretty incredible. But um, yeah. Mike had his hand up, I think. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add something when I was talking about the integrative studies program. I said that the deal is you choose three minors in effect. And uh, I wanted to point out that one of them can come from another unit on campus that it come from the business school. Morgan sort of hinted at this. So you can get a minor in business, a minor in uh, mathematics and a minor in economics. and in a sense, formulate a sort of finance vision of your own. So I just wanted to make clear that uh, the miners don't all need to come from Castle. There's some diversity there as well. Yeah, that's a really great point. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions and I don't think I'm seeing any, oh, we do have a question really briefly. I would like to become a faculty member and continue my master's study in criminal justice. I'm also interested in doing research. So I'm guessing that this question is probably more, how, do, how, do, how does one become a 
faculty member? How do you get into academia? And really, we have three great folks to be able to talk about that right now. <laughs> so I can take a, a stab uh, at that um, because I did that. Uh, that wasn't my uh, intent when I became a student. Uh, and by the way, I attended U of M Dearborn as well um, as an undergrad. And um, in order to become a faculty member, um, you will need, of course, not only to complete your uh, bachelor's degree, but you will also need to uh, complete a, a PhD, which is in the area that you're looking at in criminology and criminal justice. That's the highest uh, degree that is offered. Um, and a PhD is, uh, it's different than uh, your undergraduate uh, degree in that it's much more focused on doing uh, unique and individualized research. Uh, so you will obviously, you continue to take some additional coursework, but the primary purpose of the PhD is for you to engage in um, a research project where you will make your own contribution uh, to the field. And then once you've earned the PhD, uh, you would be in a position to be able to apply uh, for, for, faculty, uh, for faculty jobs. So um, the average length of a PhD program is on the order of uh, maybe five years, although I took longer, um, but that, that's pretty typical uh, post uh, your post baccalaureate degree. What I can say right now is that uh, admissions to PhD programs are very competitive. Um, uh, and having a, a master's degree that uh, the student referenced as well would be an, an advantage. Likewise, uh, a lot of the things that Eunice um, uh, and Mike mentioned uh, in terms of high impact practices, a, a research project that you did as an undergraduate, maybe you got your name on a publication with a faculty member, uh, uh, maybe did an internship, um, uh, or you participated in the Talent Gateway, so Patty made reference of that earlier. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are going to, uh, to, to set you apart from other students and that will give you uh, some interesting things to talk about uh, in your application. The application's pretty straightforward. Um, it had been the case that uh, the GRE was a requirement, although increasingly that is less the case. Um, you will have to write a statement of purpose, which is another good thing to work with a faculty member on. Um, you'll have to have letters of recommendation, which is another reason why it's important for you to communicate with and get to know your faculty members so that they can write letters that speak to your, not just your abilities in the classroom, but who you are as a person and what your interests are and the like. So I'll stop there and see if anyone else has anything they wanted to add quickly. I wanted to add something just about the CCJ dimension. So Ninye, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, how focused your question was, but, uh, when you pursue CCJ courses with us, you'll find that um, some of your instructors aren't professors, but in fact are professionals in the community. Uh, criminal justice is a very practical area, and in that sense, um, it's not purely academic. So if you go into mathematics, I, I am a mathematician. I won't talk about that. I'll leave that to Eunice. But to get a PhD in mathematics is a different path than it would be for CCJ or even for history. And if I may, I'll just say, yes, uh, the undergraduate research perspective will be great uh, because it, it's great that you are planning to be a faculty member. It's, it's a great plan. Uh, and we are all like three of us faculty members and we really enjoy it. Uh, but undergraduate research will also give you a sense of if you whether you really want to do it or not. Uh, so for for eight weeks over the summer or a capstone course with a, a professor in that program or a semester long activity will you will give you a good idea whether you want to in, invest five, six years to get your PhD uh, or not. Or if you decide that that was the right decision for you, that experience will help you to uh, 
zoom in a little bit more which part of that general area you want to focus on. As Mike said, maybe you want to be on the academic side or maybe you want to be in the field on the more practical side. So doing an undergraduate research project with a faculty member will help you to make those uh, detail, those plans in fine detail, and also will put you over over the over your peers when you apply to programs, when you have a publication, when you have a mentor that will work with you to craft that uh, personal statement. So do get in touch with uh, folks in uh, your program and try to complete a project with them. I think and that, that non-traditional background um, actually will likely serve you very well because you, you will bring something very uh, different and unique um, to the program and graduate programs increasingly are looking for uh, um, what it is that uh, students can bring to the program, not just what the program can do for, for them. So um, I think that that actually uh, will put you in, in very good stead and make you very competitive. Um, if I can also add something, the fact that you have experience, I think um, a lot of students, and maybe you can speak for yourself on this one, and this is no offense to the three faculty we have on board today, but I remember my undergraduate experience and I loved learning from folks who were in the professional field because they shared such a different view um, with their students of, of what it's like. So I think the fact that you have that, that experience and, and you've been in law enforcement for so long, you can really bring a a different side um, of that career field um, than maybe someone who just went straight from undergrad into a PhD program into teaching. So I think that that in itself will really put you apart if you do go to apply for those PhD programs and then eventually become a faculty member. So I think, I think that's great. If I may, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, it's a great conversation. And you don't need to complete that research project in uh, criminal justice. It can be many other fields. For example, just a few days ago, a couple of our colleagues were talking about predictive policing in different uh, communities. And they had undergraduate students working with them to analyze data in Los Angeles area and try to craft better algorithms to predict what may happen and how to deploy their resources. So that research project can be criminal justice with something else. And that kind of uh, interdisciplinary research will be really interesting, whatever you want to do later on. Yeah, and very quickly, I'll just throw into the mix that um, unlike fields like history, which is my own uh, or English, uh, where there is a, um, there are a lot of PhDs and very few jobs. Uh, criminology and criminal justice is one area that uh, still has a demand for PhDs uh, because of its sort of applied nature. Uh, it, and it's a growing area. So um, that's also, I think, important and worth noting. Definitely. Well, we have reached our time and I want to be respectful to everybody. I know that all of our students, all of our faculty and staff are very busy right now. So I want to thank all of you, um, especially our panelists for being here today and taking some time out of your day. Um, again, this entire presentation is recorded and being put up on our website. So if you missed anything, feel free to check that out. Um, again, my email is in our chat. So reach out to me with any questions you might have. Have a very happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the break. And I look forward to seeing you all um, come December, which is right around the corner. So take care, everyone.